And again, the, 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 the person that really, really uh, inspired us in Nanakuli, really helped us to, to, with the roadmap and all the tools and the teachings, is a guy that we wouldn't be here today if it wasn't him. So everybody, would you please put your hands together for Dr. Ed Salvoso! Thank you. <laughs> Folks, this is a feast. <laughs> Just remain standing for a moment. Just remain standing. Wow, wow. Uh, I'm almost in tears, you know, to see evidence of transformation. So I would like Ruth to greet you and, and pray a prayer and then I'll share a brief word. <laughs> We are so excited and so touched to be here and to hear these testimonies of the power of God and to be a part of it, not only to listen, but to, to be a part. It's so exciting. Yes, you got it. You got it. The Ecclesia, <laughs> the ecclesia starts in the home. But from here, this will be a detonator. From here to the nations, not only to the islands, we believe that it's going to go, it's incre not incredible, tremendous what is going on here. <laughs> Amen? So, Father, we thank you. We thank you for this privilege to be here today and to listening to what you are doing, Lord, in Nanakuli. Oh, Lord, we thank you. We praise you, Lord. You are moving and from here, you will go to the islands and to the states and to the nations. We praise you today, Lord, and we thank you. We thank you. We bless your name. Bless Nana Cooley. Bless these people, the congregations, and all in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Before you sit down, look at somebody in the eye and tell that person, I bless you and I bless you in Jesus' name. <clears throat> Folks, uh, like Ruth says, we feel so honored to be here, and, um, and I have uh, actually a brief word because uh, most of the important things have been said, so my job is to wrap it up, okay, and, um, and you know, I was listening in the spirit as well as in the natural. When Ruth first came to Nanakuli, I think it was about 22 years ago or 20 years ago. Uh, actually, we are reminded of Nanakuli because Ruth, who has a beautiful musical ear, and we have a music room in our house, it, there is a ukulele that was given to her from Nana Cooley. And it was not a cheap ukulele. It was a very, huh? Yes, yes. And, um, and, and so, but let me put it in perspective. When we first came to Nana Cooley, and I say this with the utmost respect, to put it in perspective, the locals spoke the word Nana Cooley with a sense of shame. And in fact, they didn't talk much about Nanakuli. They talk about Hawaii. But today, I listened to at least two to three hundred mentions of the word Nanakuli. And every time it was mentioned, it was mentioned with pride. And look at this slide there. Come and see what God is doing in Nanakuli. Say it, Nanakuli. Nanakuli. You see, I'm here to make a prophetic declaration. I'm not those prophets that shake and quiver and put the tape recorder. I'm an apostle who sees things in the heavens and we declare it. And one of the biggest lies that the devil is spoken to Nana Cooley. You know, in the Bible, there are redemptive gifts. You know, there are seven redemptive gifts in in the book of Romans, chapter 12. You know, the gift of exhorter, ruler, servant, prophet, giver, mercy, and so forth. And what the devil has lied to you is that this is a servant community. 
That's why they put the dump there, okay? Because they think you are here to collect the garbage of the rest of the islands. But I'm here to declare that your redemptive gift is not servant. Your redemptive gift is ruler, is government. I mean, you will set the pace for the rest of Hawaii. I mean, and that has to be declare today, okay, that you are not to be tail, but you are to be head, that you are not to be a receiver, but a giver, that you are to be above and not below, that you are a giver and not a taker, because the devil lies as to your identity. And another thing that I noticed was the reference to pent-up anger you know, and how God helped you to overcome that and turn it into a virtue. But let's put that in perspective. How do you think Samson felt when he was held captive, chained, his eyes extracted? He felt angry and he was made a servant, but he was not a servant by design. He was a ruler. And so can you understand that your destiny is to rule, not to domain, not to control, but like the Lord Jesus. He's the Lord. He's a servant. He's the king, right? He's the king's servant. Now you take that energy that is penned up there and you channel that into redemption as you are doing here. So put those two things in perspective. Number one, this is not a servant community. This is a ruler community that will serve Hawaii. Number one. And number two, that pent-up anger is because you were taken captive and you were made to serve others that you should be leading. And so let's put that in a broader perspective. Why are cities important to God? They are important because cities allow either God or the devil to have a seat in that city. The first city that is identified in the Bible is Babylon. It's Babel. It's the Tower of Babel. That's when people got off the ark and, uh, and God was ready to purify the land but the devil got into the picture there, you know. And then they built Babel. And they said, we build a city for ourselves. We will inform heaven what morality is. We will be, uh, if people will be afraid of us. And we will control the ends of the earth. They will come to us. So that's what the devil did. And how did God counteract that? He came down from heaven. One of the few instances when the Trinity, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, all three came down. Because they have three things. They have a common objective, they have unity, and they have communication. And any time you have a common objective, and you have unity, as I'm seeing that, and you have communication, as you are doing it through Transform Hawaii and the Accelerator, God said... Nothing that they determine to do will be impossible for them. I mean, if the non-believers can in a sense, and I say this respectfully, upset God because they are about to do the impossible, how much more you in Hawaii and in Nanakuli if you have those three things there. So Babylon... The devil establishes his headquarters there. So later on, God calls Abraham out of earth of the Chaldeans to look for a city whose builder and architect was God. Now picture that. There were no roads, no GPS. It was a wild country out there. There was jungle. And God says, leave a city that is not my city and go and look for a city that I am the architect and the builder. Abraham was a visionary. He went for that. And that set in motion a change of events that led to Jerusalem to become God's city. 
And now there, that's a city that God made the covenant with. That's a city where Solomon dedicated the temple. That's what the glory of God came upon that place. And God made a, a decree that his eyes and his ears will be attentive to the prayers, pray in that city because it was dedicated to God. So we see now the importance of city. Fast forward to Hawaii, 180 years ago or whatever the exact number is, this is a nation that was dedicated to God. This is a nation that your queen dedicated to God. This is a nation where the altars to the false God were brought down. And this is a nation that the eyes of God and the ears of God and attentive to the prayers that I pray here. But the devil counted attack with what some of you describe as a plantation mindset. You know, that you are in the plantation, you survive in the plantation, when you are destined to own the plantation. And that's why it's so important to understand the strategic value of a point of inception. Now, let me put you at this for those of you that are not from Nana Cooley. Nana Cooley is not the end, it's the beginning of the journey. You take this to Chinatown, you take this to Honolulu, you take this to every region, but this is a point of inception here. And why is this important? And this is a very important point. The devil has no kingdom. We give him more credit when we say the kingdom of darkness. You will not find that expression in the Bible. When we say the kingdom of Satan, that is not a biblical expression. The Bible describes it as the domain of Satan. There is a fundamental difference between a kingdom and a domain. A kingdom is a legal, legitimate institution. A domain is something that is established by force. Domain means to dominate. So that there is a dominion of Satan out there. You know, a dominion of Satan that is lying to us. And how does he maintain that domain? Through two things. And I'm going to, to repeat this. Darkness, say darkness, and hopelessness. Again, darkness and hopelessness. Now look how key this is. Darkness, and here we have a school principal, so probably a director, so she will verify this. Darkness and hopelessness are the kind of nouns that belong in a special category. They have no plural. They are always singular. It's incorrect to say darknesses or hopelessnesses. It's always darkness or hopelessness. Why? Because they can only be defined by the antonym. An antonym is the word that is exact opposite. So how do you define darkness? Is the absence of? How do you define hopelessness? It's the absence of hope, which tells us that semi-darkness is an oxymoron. I mean, darkness is like pregnancy. You are either pregnant or you are not pregnant, but you are never semi-pregnant, right? And so semi-darkness is incorrect. You are either in darkness or you are not. And here comes the word. You have lit a light in Nanakuli. And the control of the devil over Hawaii is crumbling. Because now you have light, you have hope to listen to our brothers, to our sisters, to testify. It's happening. It's going on. I mean, there is, it's, it's like the eyes on a lake in Minnesota that is frozen for three months. When it cracks at the beginning of the spring, there is no going back. It will keep cracking and cracking and cracking until eventually it disappears. So cities are important. Not only Babylon was a strategy for Satan, 
Jerusalem was a strategic for God. Bethlehem, a little tiny village, was key as a cradle for Jesus. Capernaum in Galilee, Ruth and I had the privilege to visit there and see the site where it was a synagogue where Jesus attended, you know, on the, on the Sabbath there. So those are important cities. But there is a city in the New Testament that I believe Nanakuli is the modern equivalent of that. The gospel was established in Jerusalem. The first 3,000 men got saved and baptized there. And when it says men there, it implies households, which could be more than 3,000 because the wife and the children and the slaves and the indentured workers could have been 40, 50,000 people that got saved on the day of Pentecost. Later on, another 5,000 got saved, you know? And uh, who knows? And at one point, all of Jerusalem was filled with the doctrine. So the devil is in trouble, right? The gospel is thriving. But now there is a problem. Priests are getting safe. And priests get the, their paycheck, so to speak, from the temple. And even though Jesus said that the temple was going to be destroyed, was not destroyed yet, and now we have a financial problem. And so maybe the financial advisors got together with the apostles and they said, I think we need to create a parenthesis between the old covenant that ended and the new covenant that is beginning and we need to incorporate these priests. And they came up with a very tragic compromise that until the temple was destroyed, no believer should be circumcised and should be introduced into Jewish liturgy and should be first Jewish and then Christians. And at that moment, the devil compromised the purity of the gospel because Jesus told the apostles, you know, in Acts 1.5, you shall receive power, say power, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And what would you do with that? You will be my witnesses. Where? In Jerusalem. And next, Judea. And then Samaria. And then the ends of the earth. And because they were so Jewish in their worldview, they said, oh Lord, that means that you're going to rebuild Jerusalem. And the kingdom will be restored to us. And everybody will come to us. And Jesus said, no, 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 no. It begins in Jerusalem. It begins in Nanakuli, but it doesn't end there. It goes to other places. And that's what tragically happened at the beginning of the book of Acts. The church became servant to the tradition of the old system. And we have to understand, and I am not minimizing the pain and the tragedy of COVID. I mean, it's terrible what is going on. But COVID, like wars, like earthquakes, like persecution, like hunger, like famine in the Bible, they always gave birth to an explosion and expansion of the church. And we are faced now with a new, new order that we don't know exactly what it is. We don't know how to define it. But here in Nadakuli, you are beginning to express it. I was telling Ruth, as I listened to you talk about the ecclesia, like established thing. Oh, that's the ecclesia. We are the ecclesia. Listen, I was there when there wasn't there. <laughs> and when I was writing my book, Ecclesia, people said, what do you mean by that? What do you mean? What about the local church? I just rest my case. You are taking the ecclesia all over the place. It's out of control, right? That is what is happening right now. So God allowed the persecution to come, and that persecution scattered everybody. And in Acts chapter 11, verse 19 says, So then those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose in connection with the martyrdom of Stephen made their way to Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch. These are regions way out there. And speaking the word to no one except to Jews alone. 
because that's what they were taught, you know. They have to become responsible members of our church. They have to come forward. They have to be discipled. They have to be baptized. They have to learn how to do communion and so forth. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who came to Antioch and began speaking to the Gentiles also, preaching the Lord Jesus, and the hand of the Lord was with them, and a large number believed and turned to the Lord. These two guys did what you are doing here. <laughs> I heard you introduce a sister as a senior pastor of something. What are her credentials? What seminary did she go to? I mean, what presbytery sanctioned that? I mean, what legal status do you have? Probably none of the above. You are doing something weird. <laughs> but it's weird only until it works. And when it works, it ceases to be weird, right? So these guys are doing something weird, but the hand of the Lord is with them. And listen to the Holy Spirit. The hand of the Lord is with you. That is your credential. The hand of the Lord is with you. It's interesting that the guys that broke the rules are from Cyprus and another one from Cyrene. Cyprus is where Barnabas was a Levite, was from. Levites were servants to the priest. And the guy was a Jew, but not a Jew from Jerusalem. Was a Jew from a despised community. And he was not a member of the ruling class. He was a servant. And he's the one that eventually brings Paul into the fold. The other guy is from Cyrene. Why is that important? Because it was Simon from Cyrene. Believed to be a black man. The one that came alongside Jesus, whom he could no longer carry the cross and pick it up and carry the cross to Golgotha for Jesus to be nailed on that cross. So look now how the ancestral blessings play into, right? And they are the ones that preach that message. And when they preach that message, the hand of the Lord is with them. Now, the general council in Jerusalem hears about this heresy out there, and they decided to send an inspector. And probably Peter and James, that were the hardliners, you know, caught the flu that day, or who knows what, and they have to send Barnabas, that was his son of consolation. And when he went there, he saw the grace of God, and he encouraged them. And the numbers grew even more. And people in Nanakuli, what you have seen is just the beginning. There is a wave coming, a wave coming, where you will see large numbers of people saved. I heard Brother Juan confess that he was embarrassed or ashamed of saying that he worked for the DHHAL or whatever the initials are, right? But now you are proud to be there. Well, you will get even prouder when you begin to baptize people and lay hands on them and they will be filled with the Holy Spirit. Why? Why not? Why are they giving you carte blanche to do everything you are doing? Because you are bringing results. You are solving problems that they cannot solve. And so that's why Nana Cooley, I declare this, is the Antioch of Hawaii. This is the Antioch of Hawaii. This is the portal where something new is being legitimized. And from here, it will expand and go beyond that. It will go beyond, beyond that. Because you are shattering darkness and hopelessness. Now the people will go back to Chinatown and say, it can happen. Why? Because it's happening in Nanakuli. 
And the devil was caught asleep at the wheel because probably he was uh, with the government cities or in Waikiki, and all of a sudden you hit him in Nadakuli. And we found that God has a preference for overlooked communities, for communities that the devil discarded. They say nothing will happen there. I was reading last night and this morning again my book, That None Should Perish. And I was taking notes on myself. I mean, it's such a good book, you know. And I, and I was just being refreshed. And then I didn't know we will have this banquet here today because everything I wrote there, you're doing it, right? And I remember when I first came and I remember Carl said, what? <laughs> And I would say, Carl, this, what? Well, it's happening, Carl, look. And you cannot argue because it's happening in Hawaii. But this is the point I want to make, folks. In 1983, I was fighting an incurable disease. I was taking 16 injections a day. Do the math. That's about 500 a month. I was taking 42 pills every day, chemotherapy every 15 days, major surgery. I was hanging in there, fighting for my life. At night, I have to put a picture of Ruth and our four girls by our bed just to gather the strength to live through hell that night so that I could live through hell the next day because I was only 34 years old and I didn't want to die. I wanted to do something. And it's in that moment, and I bring this up because there will be tribulation, there will be problems, there will be opposition, but they will purify you. And it was in that context that Ruth and I made the decision to dedicate our property in Argentina, okay, to build a prayer chapel because we identify 108 towns within 100 miles with our Christian witness. I'm sure when Ruth and I made that decision, the devil says, don't even bother to send a junior demon. This guy is dying, okay? His medical bills are $10,000 a month. I mean, uh, I don't think he will last. And that was his mistake. Because Ruth will drive me to the airport, I will get on a plane, I will begin to build that chapel until I collapse. And when I collapse, they will carry me to the airport, put me on a plane, she will pick me up, take me to the hospital, they will patch me up and go back there until that chapel was built. When we are building that chapel, the place was flooded. Then after that, it caught fire. Then we have accidents, people were killed, you name it, we got it. But we never quit. We say, no way. If I perish, I perish, but I choose where to perish. And then when I am wrestling with this, why is the devil so upset over this? I mean, you know, I'm going to be dead, according to the doctors. This chapel is a piece of brick and mortar. I mean, what's going on? Then the Lord revealed that two towns down the road was the headquarters of a major warlock that controlled the whole region and have left behind 12 apostles and dedicated his headquarters as a place of darkness. And then my eyes were open to it. And I gathered a group of pastors. Most of them didn't dare, but I gathered a few Allen and Cardina sides. And we drove there, and we served an eviction notice. I mean, there was nothing in me to intimidate the devil. I was dying. But I have the authority of the ecclesia. It were four of us. I was so afraid of demons, I didn't know what I know today, that before I served the eviction notice, I said, listen, guys, let me reposition the car. I'm going to put it in first gear, serve the eviction notice, and we take off like a rocket. And we did. But a few months later, a church was planted there. The head apostle for the witch doctors became the pastor. Today there are 30 churches there. And 108 towns have churches there. Why? Why not? 
because we shatter hopelessness, we shatter darkness. This is what you are doing in Nana Kuli. You are shattering that. Now I was hoping that God will take this to a nice place. He took us to resistencia. Even the name is an insult. means opposition. Welcome to Opposition City. I mean, 400,000 people, only 5,173 believers in 70 churches, deeply divided. And we go there, but we found that Alan Cardina, that Eli Capi, had seven of them. Seven pastors agreed to pray. And then there was a tipping moment, similar to Allen kneeling before the people, when one of the seven pastors acknowledged to the other six, the opposite of love is that hatred is indifference. And I have never rejoiced with you nor wept with you. Would you forgive me? And that changed the climate. And now we, began, we got the download on prayer evangelism right there. But I have never prayed for a mayor. It was such a blessing to listen to Stacy and see you praying for people in government. But I'm talking 30 some years ago. You never touch a mayor. You never touch anybody in authority. You stay clear from them. But there was a guy that was radical. He was weird. <laughs> His church had disciplined him for hanging around sinners. And the Lord told me, go with Tito and see the mayor. That was a capital sin in evangelical Christianity 30 years ago, to go and see a mayor. But I went without anybody knowing. I met with the mayor. And when he began to talk about the city, the Lord told me what he told Alan. He loves the city and you don't. He weeps for the city and you don't weep for it. And right there, God changed my heart. And I offered to build water tanks without any money. I offered to bring a, a huge machine to read the uh, channels for the flood, not to destroy the city. All by faith. And God allowed us to do that. And when I was about to leave, I offered to pray. I have never prayed for a mayor before. He was a towering guy, a colonel in the army. His eyes filled with tears. He was so touched by my prayer. But now I have a problem. I need to confess my sin to the pastors. And so the pastor found out that we went to see the mayor without the council approving that. So they organized a lunch, you know, and they were going to kill us, but they will feed us before. And I feel like Peter, you know, having to explain what I did at Cornelius' house. And I'm beating my time. I don't want to face the fighting squad when the mayor pulls up. And he walks in. And where does an 800-pound gorilla sit? Anywhere he wants, right? The mayor shows up, everybody's polite. Welcome, Mr. Mayor, what can I do for you? He says, what you gave me yesterday, she said to me, I want it again. Would you pray for me again? And when I pray for him, he was slain in the spirit, hit the floor, and everybody said, this is good, we should pray more for mayors. And that changed everything there. Folks, I want to illustrate with this the power of breaking through, the power of doing things that are weird, but they are not weird once you do them. And I want to declare, as I bring this to a close, this is a day for you, all of you, to serve officially an eviction notice on the principalities and powers over Hawaii, and particularly over Anakuli, Nanakuli. Serve an eviction notice. For us, serving that eviction notice was the tipping point. Going to pray for the mayor was the tipping point. The little tiny actions that we take that shatter the darkness there. And it's very, very important for you to realize this. Once you serve an eviction notice, Satan falls. And when he falls, serpents and scorpions become visible. 
That means it will look uglier at first. It will look more difficult. I mean, you talk about leukemia, meningitis, myasthenia gravis, uh, murder attempts, assaults. I plead guilty to all of that. But look where we are today. Look where we are today. So yes, there will be an eruption of opposition. But that's the Lord allowing you to know where the enemy is for you to go and tread upon them. If you do that, you will plant ecclesias in the most unthinkable places. And you will do weird things like calling a sister the senior pastor. And you will be anointing people to be elders over ecclesias in government, in business, in education, in entertainment. You know, we were already witnessing this, uh, hey, Kelly Boy, you know. We were listening to how great thou art at the Hawaiian village uh, campus last night. Every night, I mean, they end up with that rendition of how great thou art. That must be some of your crowd doing that there. Why? Why not? Why not? Why not? So in conclusion, folks, Satan's fear is that you will discover that you are not a servant, that you are a ruler. Satan's fear is that you will escape from the land of captivity and you will join those that hate him. Who hates the devil and his demons? Angels. Angels are not this manicure, mascara, you know, uh, <laughs> nice thing in long rows, braces. No, no, those are cherubims and seraphims. Angels are warring angels. They love a fight. They love a fight. You want to see angels? Get in a fight with the devil, and he will come to help you, okay? And so Pharaoh's fear was, oh, my goodness, if they discover that they are not our slaves, they will join those in the event of war. And there is a war going on right now. But you see, Ukraine and Russia are the gods of war, okay, that... In the same fashion that demons hate each other and they compete for the control of a life, the, the principality of Russia is fighting with the principality of Ukraine and manipulating the government there. But the answer is the ecclesia rising up, which is a subject for another day. So in conclusion, folks, I want you to consider and receive this. Nana Kuli, it's a ruling community. It's a ruling community. It's a community that is here to rule. Your businesses are going to prosper. If you are in the marketplace, raise your hand and say, that's for me. Your business will prosper. You will do so well that people will incorporate businesses in Nanakuli because they will do better on account of being incorporated in Nanakuli. Marriages celebrated here will not suffer divorce. Why? Why not? Because the heavens are open and when the benediction is pronounced, that marriage will be sealed. You're already seeing evidence in education. You will continue to move up and up and up and up. And eventually the whole state will learn from Nana Cooley how to do education. But you have to shake off the chains. And you have to realize that it's not enough to ask God for a nation. You have to possess a nation. You have to go there and say, I'm going to declare that I am the ecclesia and I will dedicate this place as an ecclesia. And you will go out there and you will commission people to be the ecclesia. It's going to be weird at first. But only until it works. If the hand of the Lord is with you, everybody will back you up. So I propose this for closing. Alan and Mary, would you join me here? And Ruthie, would you join me? I would like to suggest that if this is agreeable to you, and it better be agreeable because <laughs> I'm telling you, 
that we all joined with those that spoke this morning. If you spoke, would you come forward and stand up here? And we all serve an eviction notice over the principalities over Nana Cooley. And we declare that Nana Cooley is God's Nana Cooley. Amen? And the leadership of Transformation Hawaii, would you join us? We are going to make that declaration. Amen? Okay, would you stand up where you are, folks? Uh, are you ready for war? The kingdom of God suffered violence, and the violence inherited it. Amen? So we are going to declare that Nana Kuli, Daniel, what are you doing there? Come here, come on. I mean, uh, we are going to declare that Nana Kuli is a ruler city. Amen? Can I get an amen to that? And we're going to serve an eviction notice. And this will have a ripple effect all the way to Chinatown, to Honolulu, to all the neighborhoods. You will carry this anointing with you. Amen? So everybody raise up your hand and declare with me. Father God, let it be known in heaven and on earth and even under the earth and especially under the earth. That today, here, now, we, your ecclesia, is standing in your word, indwelled by the Holy Spirit, protected by angels. We serve an eviction notice on the principalities over this region. And we say to them, Whatever your name is, my commander in chief, the Lord Jesus Christ defeated your commander in chief, Satan. And in the name of Jesus, we serve an eviction notice. And we declare Nanakuli is God's Nanakuli, the government. Business, education, belong to Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give a big hand to the Lord. And before we wrap it up, before we wrap it up, with your permission, I would like to commission you to plant ecclesias. What is an ecclesia? Two or three people gather around the presence of Jesus. Now you say, well, I haven't gone to seminary. Praise God. <laughs> you just listen to Jesus and do it. So Alan and Mary, if you can stand behind them, covering them. And Jesus said, he who believes in me shall be saved. That one you have clear, right? But the next verse says, he who believes in me shall cast out demons, heal the sick, survive a poison, and handle snakes. That's all in the same thing. So if you have believed in Jesus, you already have the anointing for healing the sick, for casting out demons, okay, for overcoming poison, for handling the snakes. It's all in the same package. You have it. You say, but Brother Ed, I don't believe it. Welcome to the club. I want you to read Mark 16 again. And verse 14 says that Jesus rebuked them because they were reclining at tables and they haven't believed the messenger that he sent them who saw Jesus alive. And he said, I'm rebuking you. And the best rebuke, this is your penalty. Go and preach the gospel to every creature. Heal the sick. Okay, deliver those that are demon oppressed. And when you do that, you will have proof that I am alive. So, Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, we commission them now, Lord. We commission them to be apprentices of something new rather than remain experts at something old, Lord. I pray that as they enter the sphere of influence, Lord, your presence will enter 
and there will be evidence that your hand, the hand of the Lord is with them. Father, I release them to cast out demons, to heal the sick, to overcome evil, and to give evidence that the ecclesia is expanded. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Yeah, amen. Amen. Go and give heaven to the devil. Amen. <laughs> amen. Now, what you do in the next 24 hours is key. I want you to do a prophetic act. Or the first day you are back at work, do something prophetic. Make a declaration, okay? And tell Pastor Allen what you have done. Allen, I return the mic to you. All right, thanks. All right, thanks, Ed.